Yeah, there was a young man who was on an airplane. His name was uh, Xu Xuan uh, from Taiwan. And he was, on a, he was on a very long flight. And he was listening to his music with uh, one of those wireless earpieces uh, in his ears. They're, they're getting so small these days. In fact, they were so small that somehow, when he fell asleep, uh, it ended up, one of them ended up in his mouth and he swallowed it. So Shu Xuan uh, woke up missing uh, his right earpiece. And he looked around, couldn't find it, and he turned on his location finder because, you know, it'll make the earpiece ping. So he turns it on and, and it began, they began looking for it and they found it inside. It was like beat, beat, beat inside of his stomach. <laughs> and as, as soon as they landed, uh, uh, Shu went to the hospital where they gave him a laxative. And in a short amount of time, he was able to recover his earpiece. <laughs> and apparently the story had a good ending. Get it? A good ending. <laughs> uh, he was able to, to wash the earpiece and it was still working. <laughs> uh, so he just kept right on using it. Uh, now, I, I know this is kind of gross, but uh, today Jesus is teaching a very important truth to us. Uh, he says that what goes in must come out. <laughs> and this is something so basic, but Jesus uses it to help us understand something so powerful and profound that we can be encouraged by it every hour of every day. Now, we've been going verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark, and this is one of the great things about going verse by verse. You come upon topics you would not normally cover, but here we are. And we saw last time that the religious leaders from Jerusalem sent some representatives to investigate Jesus. And there, there, there were so many crowds starting to, or gathering around him everywhere he went at this point in his ministry. And the religious leaders were starting to get, to feel threatened. And so they sent these Pharisees and scribes to investigate. And they sent them uh, a, about a hundred miles to come and visit uh, and, and follow Jesus and to hear him. Uh, for our international listeners, that's about 160 kilometers. Uh, now, what led up to this uh, in the previous verses in Mark 7 was that these religious leaders saw Jesus' disciples eating food without washing their hands properly. Not that the disciples' hands were filthy, but it, it, it's, it's that they had not washed them according to the uh, man to their man-made traditions. It's kind of like, uh, I use this example of a surgeon who goes in, uh, who's about to operate. Surgeons, you know, they'll really sanitize their hands before they, they do surgery. But surgeons don't wash their hands like that every time they eat food. And, and that's really what the Pharisees and scribes were pointing out here uh, uh, to Jesus about his disciples not washing, like the surgeons, you know, ceremonially. And Jesus told them, that this way, their way of doing things, those tra tra traditions were, were overriding God's law at this point in history, and it was all messed up. So now Jesus is continuing here in um, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, and we'll pick it up here in verses 14 through 19. He says, and he called them, and he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside of a person that, is that, that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house, he left the people. His disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. Thus he declared all foods clean. Now, let's pause there for a bit. Um, way back in the Old Testament, in the first books of the Bible, God had forbidden eating the eating of certain foods. When God laid down the law, he told the Jews which animals were clean and which animals were unclean. And I hate to throw pigs under the bus, but let's use 
pigs as an example because they're, they're the most obvious. They're everywhere. Pigs are, were considered an unclean animal back then, and yet today it is the most widely eaten meat on the planet. Uh, now, um, we host international students, dozens of them flow through our house uh, every semester. They're from all over the world. And depending on where they're from, many of them have never eaten pork. Sometimes in conversation, they'll ask me if I eat pork. And I, I'll be truthful with them. And I'll say, yes, I do eat pork. I grew up with it. You know, it's part of our culture, especially here in Texas. And they, they'll often then give me health reasons for why I should not eat pork. And I can, under, I can follow their line of logic. I can follow their line of reasoning for reasons not to eat pork. But all the while, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, you have never tasted bacon. <laughs> I'm, I'm, saying, yeah. I'm bacon and eggs, uh, tacos with uh, potato, uh, uh, bacon and some cheese is just, I mean, like I read that some people like bacon and peanut butter. Uh, I don't know if I like bacon that much. <laughs> I don't even think I want to try that one. But that's how popular it is. But I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to push the issue with students because uh, I don't want to offend them. Um, although we did have one student who had never eaten beef. And now beef was considered a clean animal, but in this young man's particular tradition and culture, he, he was raised to not eat beef at all. And, but now that he was in America, uh, he said he wanted to try a hamburger for the first time in his entire life. And nobody, uh, all of his friends, all of the other students, they didn't think that was a good idea. Uh, they told him not to do it, but he insisted uh, that this was what he had been looking forward to since he knew he was coming here. So I said, well, uh, if you're going to try a hamburger for the first time, you are in the home of Whataburger. You know, there are Whataburgers are all over Texas, and they started right here in Corpus Christi, Texas. So uh, on his own, he went to Whataburger, and he ordered a triple meat <laughs> hamburger, and he ate the whole thing. He got so sick. And all of his friends told him that, uh, you know, we told you you shouldn't have done that. But... When he'd recovered, uh, he said that he now wanted to try a big steak. Uh, so uh, food is, is, a, was a big, is a big issue today. And it was a huge issue for first century Jews. The Jews listening on Jesus, to Jesus on that day in Mark 7, they would have been repulsed by the idea of eating pork. They abhorred pigs. They saw them as dirty, filthy, vile animals. And that's why in Jesus' famous story, the prodigal son, the young man, you know, he left his father's farm and he took his inheritance and he went to a faraway land and he partied like there was no tomorrow. And he wasted all of his money on wild living and then a famine hit. And the only job that he could find in Jesus' story was, was with a farmer who hired the young man to feed his pigs. And all of Jesus' listeners hearing the story would have known right there just how far away the young man had gone, right? Not only had he traveled a long distance outside of their region to where there were pig farmers, but he had also gone so far spiritually from the way he had been raised as a, as a, as a boy. So in their minds, that, that young man hit rock bottom because no Jew in his right mind would work with such repulsive animals. In fact, uh, to give you an example of how much they detested this, less than two centuries before this, the Jews had an incident in their history. They revolted in what is known as the Maccabean Revolt in this region of Judea. Before the Romans, it was the Greeks. Remember with Alexander the Great and all of that? Well, when Alexander died, his huge empire was divided up among his generals. And one of those territories was this region where the Jews lived. The ruler at the time was, named, was a man named Antiochus IV, and he was a Greek Hellenistic king. Antiochus got it in his head that he wanted to force Greek culture on the Jews. And the best way he thought that he could do that was by forbidding them to practice from practicing their traditional Jewish customs. 
So Antiochus came into Jerusalem. He desecrated their temple. And he commanded them to eat pork. And he figured that if they started to eat pork in time, they would start to forget all about their religion. Well, this was a huge insult to the Jews, as you can imagine, especially to those who were the most faithful Jews. And they would rather die than eat the pigs. And so in the, this Maccabean revolt, there is a story of a widow who had seven sons. As Antiochus was trying to force them to eat the pork, all seven sons refused to eat this meat, which God had for, forbidden them to eat. And one by one, the sons were tortured and mutilated right in front of their mother's eyes. And as each one was being tortured, she kept encouraging them to die courageously. And in the end, she too was killed. And this is how faithful they were to the law of God. This lady and her seven sons were considered heroes. And now fast forward to almost two centuries, and here Jesus is now teaching the Jews something different. He was telling them that this kind of food would no longer be unclean. And the people were in shock. I mean, they, they didn't understand what he meant by this. And even Jesus' disciples were confused by this. And that's why they, when they came inside with him alone, they were like, could you explain this to us? We don't understand. And this will continue to be a big issue on into the New Testament. Uh, it comes up immediately in the book of Acts when you read the birth of the New Testament church. And the Apostle Paul will address this topic again and again in many of his, letter, uh, many of his letters to the churches. And so what the disciples and the New Testament church will come to understand is that the Old Testament law was part of a bigger picture. This was part of what distinguished God's people from the pagans around them. God had given them 10 commandments and over 600 laws. So in the Old Testament, their way of worship, their way of keeping the Sabbath, their way of eating was meant to set them apart. To, to show the pagans that these Jews were different. They were chosen. They were the representatives of God on earth. And so through the centuries, even though they were still practicing their religion, their hearts were not in it. Uh, they were just kind of going through the motions. They had added so many traditions to God's laws that everything just kind of started to blur into one to the point we're here, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, had come onto the stage of history, and they missed it. But some did believe. And they experienced God's love in a whole new way. In fact, uh, in Romans 7, later on, the Apostle Paul is going to give some amazing insight into how God's law and God's love work together to be reconciled in Christ Jesus. And in that one chapter, Romans 7, it's like, it's, he, he for just as an example, he referenced the law 27 times in that one chapter. And he started by using the example of husbands and wives. And, and I want to read a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there. I'll read this for us. But Romans 7, verses uh, 2 and 3, he says, when a, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the law of marriage no longer apply the, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So death dissolves the tie that the law had to bind a couple legally because the law no longer applies. Uh, the other day, a pack of guys on high-speed motorcycles passed us up on the, on, on the highway and uh, they zoomed in and out of traffic so fast. Uh, they, were, they, they were weaving in and out with no regard for human life, I'm telling you. Uh, they were breaking so many laws. It was dangerous. One wrong move and one of them could have been killed. Now, if one of those guys were to crash and die, the police would not show up at the scene of the accident and see the dead uh, cyclist 
uh, he, the, the police would not give him a ticket, even though he broke a lot of laws to get there. Because when the person's dead, they're beyond the reach of the law. And this is what the law does. It brings judgment. And when, but when we place our faith in Christ, we die to ourselves spiritually when we give our hearts to Jesus. And now we're no longer condemned because we're beyond the reach of the law. And then Paul dives even deeper uh, there in Romans 7 and verse 22. He says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells within my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He's getting so deep here because God is perfect and pure. And in order for us to have a relationship with God, we have to be perfect and pure. Uh, and that's why Paul says he delights in the law of God, because the closer we get uh, or align our lives with God's word, the closer we'll be to our God-given potential. God's word can help us become the people that God, the, the people that God made us to be. So God's word is good. It shows us where we went wrong. Uh, and notice that the Apostle Paul says there that the, my members are waging war against my mind. Waging war, that phrase is, is, is a Greek word that means to line up the troops and to go out on a military campaign. And that's a picture of what sin does and wants to do inside of us. This flesh of ours is constantly wanting to oppose God's will and God's word. And the more we get away from God's word, the more we will be defeated. Not only do we have the world coming against us, we have the devil who's against us. And then on top of that, these desires inside of our own flesh that want to pull us down. And this is why in the Old Testament, the Jews had to keep making sacrifices. Because every time they broke God's laws, it was a sin against God. They would come to worship and, and they would kill a bird or a, or a goat or a bull to atone for their sin. And all of this Old Testament blood from the animals didn't take away their sin. It just covered it. But that act of killing the, the animal uh, pointed by faith to a future time when Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, would shed his blood for us. And so now we have, because of Jesus, we have a new covenant. That's why our Bibles are divided in, uh, by the Old Testament and the New Testament. That means the Old Covenant and the New Covenant has come. And, and so that's why, if you notice, uh, notice uh, again, going back to Mark 7, verses 20 through 23. Listen to this. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within... Out of the heart of the man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within and they defile a person. There are 13 sins listed here, and, and it's not a complete list, but it covers more, most things, right? Uh, even Christians can commit these sins. If we've been born again, we should be grieved by sin because the Holy Spirit within us is grieved. We should repent of the sin, that is, turn away from it and turn to God. And this can happen every day because Jesus raised the bar of holiness even higher. And he said that even if we don't act out on our sins, just letting them into our hearts and letting them dwell there, that is a sin. He said, and, and he described it this way in Matthew 5, 21, he said, if you, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. That, that's one of the commands, right? If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, 
if you are even angry with someone and you, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, this is in the New Living Translation of the Bible. If you call someone an idiot, uh, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So that's how the Pharisees looked at sin, like that. They thought, I haven't murdered, therefore I'm not a murderer. I'm innocent. And yet all the while in their heart they have hatred and anger toward their brother. And Jesus is saying here that murder starts deep inside first. And if you let it, let it stay there by cursing your brother, then you, you've already sinned. I read uh, uh, about two bank robbers who, in the course of their robbery, they killed the bank president. And they fled away in a getaway car. And when they were far enough away, they stopped to eat at a diner. They sat down, the two men ordered hamburgers, and when the food came, one of the men suddenly remembered that it was Good Friday. Some people of faith, you know, they abstain from eating meat on Good Friday, which is the, the Friday before Easter. So this man remembered, and he sent the food back. Because just as Jesus sacrificed his flesh, people also sacrifice as a way to identify with their suffering, with Jesus' suffering, by not eating meat on those day, on good, on Friday. Now, remember, uh, the two men were on the run from the law. <laughs> I say, why don't you go ahead and eat the meat and stop robbing banks? <laughs> How about you eat meat and quit killing people? And this is an example of how Christians can become trapped in cycles of sin. We put our traditions ahead of God's word. We focus on externals and ignore the heart. And that's why Proverbs 4, 23, 20 through 23 says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. And above all, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. When the Bible refers to the heart, it's talking about the center of our being. Uh, the heart is connected to our minds. And this is where the battle with temptation and sin is won in the heart. And that's why we have to guard it. You know, when, we're, when you drive down these Texas roads, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, sometimes you'll see guards at the gate of properties. <clears throat> It might, be a, uh, it might be a gate out in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> and there's a guard next to it. Um, usually that's because they're putting in oil well, or these days they're, uh, you know, all these wind farms are going up. Uh, if, if you're not with the company that's building these things, the guard will not let you in the gate. Because only those who are authorized can get in. We need to set a guard at the gate of our heart. We should only accept something onto the property of our hearts using God's word as our guide. So if some thought, some worry, some fear, some insecurity, something that doesn't, something that doesn't align with God's word, close the gate. Don't let them in. Don't let it through. They are not authorized to be there. And if we don't guard the gate of our heart, don't be surprised if you see evil thoughts coming onto the property uh, to set up camp. And then they start ordering construction material. Come on through. There's nobody at the gate. And this is where I, I don't want to pass over what Jesus said in Mark 9, 19. And again, it might be kind of crude, but this is the part or Jesus is explaining it as it is, right? I'll read it from the New Living Translation. Uh, he said, food doesn't go into the heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. For example, uh, when a cow eats grass, that comes out as a cow patty. <laughs> I remember as a kid, the first time I saw a cow patty was in a field near near my house, just outside of our neighborhood. 
uh, the cow patties were everywhere and uh, they were dry. I, I thought they were Frisbees, so I started throwing, throwing them at my friends. <laughs> and my, my friends were, said, those are not Frisbees. The, that is cow manure. And they were kind of grossed out that I was touching them. But really, it's just chewed up grass, right? Cow chips. And so this is, this is how this truth can apply to our lives today. We might be dealing with certain sins. Some people in our world today would, might prefer to call them just weaknesses or syndromes or deficiencies, habits, addictions. But the root of it all is sin. That's the manure. That's why it's so easy for us, for, for, these, for thoughts to become habits. Bad attitudes can overwhelm us and uh, despair can set in and hopelessness can overtake us because we didn't guard the gate. And now we're having a hard time kicking these things out of our property, off of our property. And these, these are choices that we make every day. And we're making decisions that will affect our future. And those are really symptoms of a deeper problem. As the saying goes, listen, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We, we sin because we're sinners. We're born that way. And that's why it's so easy for us. If you notice, it doesn't take much to make promises and we don't keep them. Uh, we tell ourselves we're not going to talk like that anymore. And then we keep, it, keep, it, keeps, it just keeps slipping out. Uh, we say we're not going to lose our temper. And then we, we snap. Uh, jealousy and envy rise up. Uh, we lose our way. We stumble in the wrong direction. Uh, we might jump from overspending to overeating to undereating to substance abuse. We battle with our desires anywhere from lust to laziness. And that's why you feel at times like you're not good enough. And then the reason we may struggle, uh, that's why we struggle to find our identity. And, and, and so the question is, what are we supposed to do when we become Christians? And instead of feeling victorious, it seems like we're walking in constant defeat. That, that's why I love the answer that the Apostle Paul explained here in Romans 7, verse 20. I'll read it. And a couple of verses there. He says, now, if, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So even the Apostle Paul was feeling the weight of his wretchedness. And he is arguably the greatest Christian who ever lived. And yet, here he is in the struggle. The battle is weighing heavy on his heart. And then comes the unveiling. He, he, he says in verse 24, Who will deliver me from this body of death? And notice that he doesn't ask what. He, do, he doesn't ask, what will deliver me from this body of death? He, doesn't, he does not ask uh, when or where or why or how. He asks, who? And right away in verse 25, it gives the answer, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank God. And that's the key to victory. God's law gave us a desperate diagnosis. You're going to die. You're guilty. You're condemned. But God's love provides the remedy. Jesus was sacrificed as the Lamb of God. He was spotless. He was perfect. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Notice that we take, we overcome these strongholds 
The way to overcome them is by taking every thought captive to obey Christ. By focusing on Jesus, we can become the person God made us to be. Not so that God will love us more. We're already loved. He gave his son so that the whole world might be saved. He gave us his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. He gave us his word to be a light to our path. Everything our hearts are hungry for can be found in Christ Jesus. As born-again believers, we're fighting from a position of victory. You might lose a battle here and there, but the war has already been won. And with time, we start to understand more and more that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive inside of us. We can find our purpose. We can live a life of significance. Sin should not be normal any longer. The war has already been won. And yes, temptation is still enticing. Yes, this flesh of ours still has desires. But listen to the last verse that I'll share here uh, from the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 18. He says, for I know that nothing good uh, dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right. The desire is there. And in the same way, when we sin, we hate it like Paul hated it. We're repulsed by it. And we desire to live lives in the center of God's will. And I love the example from the great preacher of the 1800s, uh, C.H. Spurgeon, especially since we are... Uh, We've been talking, uh, the theme has been pigs. <laughs> he had a great pig analogy. Mm. He said, one of the marks of a child of God is that although he sins, he does not love sin. He may fall into sin, but he is like a sheep, which if it tumbles into the mud, is quickly up again, for he hates the mud. The pig enjoys it, where the sheep is distressed. We are no longer the swine that love the slop. We are the sheep that sometimes slip with our feet. As long as we're in this flesh, it's going to be a lifelong struggle. But our desire is for our clean wool to match our clean hearts. We need to understand that God doesn't call us to be good people, though he calls us to be holy. We're his representatives on earth. We're a peculiar people. We're different from the outside world, and we should live like it according to his commands. And that's just impossible for any human being to live up to without the help of God Almighty. So to walk in victory is not about being more determined, it's about being more dependent. When we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we died to our old life, and we were born again spiritually. The old has gone, and thank God the new has come. Let's go to God together in prayer. Father, we, we ask that you help, help us not get caught up with the, with the things that drag our hearts through the mud of compromise. Help us, Lord, to focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Only Jesus can cleanse us from the inside out. And help us to walk in the fullness and in the power of your spirit and move us from glory to glory for your honor. And as you're praying with me now, anywhere in the world, if you've not placed your faith in Christ Jesus, receive him today. You can be forgiven. You can have eternal life if you'll let Jesus into your heart as Savior and Lord. I want to I lead you in a prayer of commitment right now, where you are. Pray with me in your mind, from your heart, and say, Father, I believe that Jesus died for my sin. I receive him as Lord and Savior come in and cleanse my soul. Thank you for adopting me 
and to your family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.